Well, let's just go ahead and get started. So are you all enjoying DevCon this year? Yes. How many of you all have gone, come away with at least one thing you can take home and do? How many of you all are overwhelmed with the stuff you've learned that you know you'll never have time to do? Just one of you? I don't believe you. Every time I come to these, I get so inspired. I see the most amazing solutions. And uh, the, my first DevCon was in 96, in uh, 98 in Monterey, Monterey. And just some of the stuff they showed, I never even imagined was possible in FileMaker. And it really raised the bar and, and my respect for FileMaker. And since then, I've been developing for about 20 year, over 20 years in FileMaker. And uh, we've gotten to do some pretty cool stuff, too. So um, my name is Scott Howard. Uh, I am run Scott Howard Consulting, real original name there. I haven't come up with a snappy one yet. Uh, I've been doing it for about 20 years, full time for about 10. We're an FBA Platinum based in Birmingham, Alabama, and we serve clients all over the U.S. We have a uh, vertical market app that we're developing that uh, is a case management app for district attorney's offices, and um, we've got clients really in just about every industry. Um, I am I consider myself an expert at conflict resolution not because I have any degree or any certifications, but I have four children, and three of them are teenagers, and I have most of my hair. So I, I consider myself fairly adept at conflict resolution. Also, some, for some reason, I, I've always found myself brought into situations where parties are in conflict, uh, whether it be with a company and we're having uh, some really difficult to resolve issues with employees, uh, or even I, I was brought in on a case where two companies were having just a really hard time working together, and yet they had to work together in their industry. And so they brought, I was an employee of one of these companies, and they agreed to allow me to negotiate between their um, CEOs to kind of br find a way to, to bring their missions together a little bit. And I think it was for the most part successful. You know, I've had a lot of successes. Um, in conflict resolution, in customer success, uh, in um, you know, customer service. I came out of a health, uh, hospitality industry years ago. I was with Marriott for a while. And, uh, but I've also had a lot of failures. And one of the reasons that I feel like I might have learned a few things is that I do tend to learn and to really hold on to the failures until I figure out what went wrong and why, why I missed it and what I could have done to avoid it. And so I'm hoping in this session to teach you a little bit about what I've learned, just to share some things that I've learned. Uh, these are things I've learned in real life consulting, in real life uh, just being an, a, a boss and an employee and uh, a negotiator and stuff. But one of the th reasons this is such an important topic is that um, this is our business. We're in the customer service business. Some of you have vertical market products that you sell but all of us are serving somebody. It might be your users, it might be your supervisors or your district or whatever, but you're serving somebody with your FileMaker skills. And this is some interesting statistics I found uh, on Salesforce's website that customers are twice as likely to share a bad customer experience than they are to share a good one. So if you don't resolve something and in a way that satisfies the customer, and I'm gonna use customer and client interchangeably, so just partially because of my past, uh, but you're a whole lot more likely to have people talk, give you bad feedback than you are um, to give good feedback. Uh, a customer is four times more likely to buy from a competitor if the issue they had with you was a customer service issue versus a price or product issue. For us as FileMaker developers, and I've seen this played out, uh, a client who has problems with you but you resolve them, they will tend not to leave even if your price is higher or even perhaps if there's something that you do that's not quite as good as somebody else, you know? But if you ser have been serving them pretty well and you resolve a conflict, they're more likely to stick with you. But if they have a customer service is issue, that's what drives most people away. And then this is a statistic, the 12, pos 12 positive customer experiences to make up for one negative. I've heard this all over the place. I'm not sure how to interpret this entirely other than um, when, you when you really screw up with a customer, uh, it'll take some time to rebuild their trust. So if there's nothing else you take from that statistic, that's what it is. I forgot that I had this thing. Um, so I'm gonna talk about five steps that are general steps for re uh, recovering from a bad customer experience. I'm gonna share four real life stories of how I um, worked through these, and one of them is from a friend of mine's company. 
And I've got two admonitions, things that I've discovered are important, they're not really steps. And then there's one goal. You know, our goal ultimately is to serve our clients excellently, to provide excellent service, and, and to do it profitably. We've got to be able to make a living at it. There's a good quote from Pascal who said that all men seek happiness. This is prior to inclusive language, excuse me. Without exception, whether it's, whether, whatever means they employ, whether they go to war or they avoid war, they have different views, but they're still seeking for happiness. The will never takes the least step but to this object. This is the motive of every action of every man, even those who hang themselves. Kind of a negative thing to end on. But what that means is that um, our clients ultimately are looking to us to, to relieve them of some burden of an inefficient system, to uh, streamline some task that's really taking them a lot of time, costing money, tying up resources. They, they want us to make their businesses more productive, more profitable, and possibly even more enjoyable to run. Our hope is that we can use these skills that we have acquired and enjoy using to do something that we really like, to serve people, to see them benefiting from our experience. So both of us hope that this relationship is going to make us happy. Okay? It's going to make us and our constituents happy. The reality, though, is that sometimes it doesn't work. Sometimes we mess up. Sometimes there are misunderstandings, miscommunications, misinterpretations. Sometimes expectations diverge to where they no longer line up. Whoop. Oh, wait. Hmm. Sorry. OK. I did have in the right order. Um, I, I moved a few things around, so I confused myself. First story, and I've changed the name of these companies and names to protect the innocent and to protect the guilty. Um, service with a Smile is a local uh, food service company to Birmingham, Alabama, where I'm from. And they, they brought us in to do some improvements to an existing FileMaker solution. They had lost touch with the developer who did it a long time ago. It uses repeating fields. They could only put so many items on it, so we normalized the data. We you know, kept it really simple. It was a really low budget small scope project, and I thought everything was going great. We gave them a really nice little, little app, some new functionality, and then the first time I heard that there was a problem, my wife, who's my business manager, she storms into my office and she yells, I want to fire service with a smile. And I look at her, I maintain a calm demeanor, <laughs> and I say, what happened? And she says, Peggy called me and said she didn't think she needed to pay our invoice. And I was like, that's the first I've heard of that. I mean, we kind of were within scope, and we delivered her something that she liked. They're using it. So I, I asked her a few questions, and I said, I think we need to call them before we fire them. So the first step in resolving any cut client issue is to nip it in the bud, to respond quickly. You can't let things like this linger. It's the number one, uh, the first step and the most important step into resolving customer issues is as soon as you become aware of a problem, you need to address it. So I took a deep breath. I thought through some of the things that, that our conversation, and I still couldn't figure out if there was a problem. I didn't have to, in this issue, I didn't have to talk to staff, and I sort of was thinking what options would I have, and then I called her. And at the end of this, I'm going to go through the resolutions, and we're going to talk about how applying these steps, uh, how they worked out. Now, I'll give you a little heads up. Two of these, I think, worked out well. One of them worked out fair, and one of them worked out badly. So I'm going to, I'm going to be, the one that was badly was my own mistake, so I'm going to fess up. This is a chart. There's a, a metric in customer service called mean time to resolve. And it represents the, uh, the amount of time it takes from the moment you become aware of a problem to the resolution. And researchers have found a direct correlation between the length of time it takes you to get in touch with the customer and the likelihood, am I doing this the right side, the likelihood that you're going to end with well, that you're going to satisfy your customer. So the longer you wait to, to deal with this issue, the less likely it's going to be that you resolve it well, that you make your customer happy. And I'm going to post these slides, and I have linked to all these studies in this. So respond quickly. 
call the, the main stakeholder, the person that you've been, the, the, that's responsible for this, the one especially who's expressed anger. If you can't get to this person, do not leave a, a detailed message about what's going on. You want to do that either ideally face to face, but if not face to face, on the telephone. You need to hear their voice and they need to hear your voice. So be, I would, you know, it's like my teenagers, I hear stories about my teenagers' friends breaking up over text. Uh, but, you know, it, it's a tendency. We want to protect ourselves from that confrontation and there is a really strong, it's built into our DNA that we want to avoid conflict. But the reality is if we're wanting to successfully mediate a bad customer experience, we have to face it head on. So if you just can't reach the person after a, few day, after a day or two, then just leave a message saying, I understand that there's a problem. I really want to hear, hear from you, and I want to work through this, so please call. Um, there was a study done where this, uh, this research firm took uh, all the people who had left bad uh, complaints or bad reviews of some company. And they offered them, they, they contacted this group of people and they made one of two offers. One of them, they offered them an apology, they apologized for the mistake, and then they asked them if they would consider retracting the, the, or removing that bad review from their website. The second group, they offered them financial re, a refund, a reward, an incentive to pull it off. Interestingly, 43, or 33%, Actually, okay. Sorry, I got, I, that's a later one. <laughs> I'll get back to it. Um, this, is, this statistic is actually about responding quickly. Um, so 33% of people asked if they would recommend a company who they had a bad experience with. If the problem was resolved quickly, even though it was inefficiently resolved, they're more likely to recommend the company. But only 17% are willing to recommend it if the company responded slowly to, their, to the problem, but they solved the issue. So this illustrates actually that other chart, that a quick resolution is more important than a perfect resolution. So I know some of this is, and I, honestly I don't know what this means, I think this is just kind of like that baseline that uh, some people will just recommend a company even after a bad experience no matter what. So 20% almost. Um, Member services. Member services is a membership organization who one of its biggest, most difficult tasks of the year is collecting annual membership dues. Uh, they, that's their only source of revenue. Uh, it used to take them weeks and weeks to do this task. And a friend of mine was a developer at one time and he built them a really nice system that managed this process and got it down to a few days. Unfortunately, since that friend of mine had gotten out of FileMaker development, passed this, their support onto us, uh, their processes changed pretty radically at one point, and so we went in to look at fixing it, but realized that the structure really didn't fit the new process, so we proposed a project where we were going to, um, to, to, to just build them a new system. It was going along really well, and about two-thirds of the way through the project, we get an email from Francis, the, um, the main stakeholder, and she was the bookkeeper, the accountant, uh, the controller for the membership organization. She was the one responsible for this process. She just sent me an email and say, the board says we've got to cancel the project. I had no idea. I had not gotten any hints that I could think of. So what's the first thing that I did? What's the first thing you do? Act quickly, respond quickly. I called Frances. I got her on the phone. The second thing that you do is you listen intently, okay? You've got to listen to them and not talk because you, You've got to hear them. You've got to make them feel that they're important. And listening is one of the most powerful ways of making somebody feel like they're important. Uh, so don't talk. Focus on them. Ask questions and show concern. So I listened to her, and she, uh, it turned out that there was an issue with the board. The, she said the board is the one that just decided that they were spending too much money, that they weren't going to afford it, that they were going to run out of money, and they canceled it. I asked her for a face-to-face -face meeting, and I discovered in that meeting that as I was listening to her, that the board really hadn't been totally on board with this project from the beginning. They kind of were letting her, giving her what she wanted. And so uh, then I asked for a, board, a meeting with the board after we talked, 
And uh, I had that meeting, and I'll talk about that resolution at the end also, toward the end. There was a study MIT did. I don't know if you've heard of these, but there are these groups that, that um, have these peace camps, they call them, in the Middle East, where they bring Palestinians and Israelis together, and they create a space and an environment where they can talk openly about the things they struggle with, about their, what's important to them, what's, um, what their hopes are, their fears, their, 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 their hatreds and their loves. And this uh, group at MIT studied these groups and also groups that do the same thing with uh, Mexican immigrants in Arizona. They brought them together, the two groups, uh, to talk together. And these one of the things that these groups, one of the reasons they do this is they've discovered that when you take the, the disempowered, like the Palestinians, and the empowered, the Israelis, and you put them in a situation, kind of get them to, uh, to listen to each other, and you get the disempowered group now feeling like they're really being heard, it really builds their sense of somebody caring, and they open up and are willing to now start being able to talk as equals. And this is a very powerful process that listening can do for a client. This uh, researcher um, said that this, when you don't listen to somebody, they have the sense of being neglected, of being disregarded and taken advantage of. Our clients, when they have a problem and we don't respond to them or they think we haven't listened, they've paid us a lot of money. They've entrusted their business into our hands, and now they feel like that we've taken advantage of them. Any of y'all had the experience uh, where you had a Customers feel like you've ripped them off? Anyone have that experience? Quite a few of you. Let me ask you this question, and I actually meant to ask this at the beginning. How many of you are here because you're currently in a difficult customer experience that you're trying to resolve? Okay. How many are here because you want to avoid it? Okay, good. Good. Well, hopefully these things will help. Um, so, I'm going to talk about how Francis's issue was resolved at the end. Big Software. This is a friend of mine's, uh, not his company, but he's over all sales. This is a large, a nationwide uh, company that sells an, a, a very big piece of software that does regulatory compliance for a certain industry. And their product is in the hundreds of thousands of dollars. Their sales cycle tends to be long and involved. It involves support staff, sales support staff, engineers, and programmers. So they were just about ready for the CEO of this major corporation to sign up for the, their product after a long, several-month sales cycle. When one of the team members realized that one of the support sales staff had promised that they could bring back a feature that had been deprecated years ago. So what was the first thing that Bruce, my friend, did? Respond quickly. So Bruce immediately started making calls to his team to figure out what went on. They found out that uh, one of the newer support staff, sales support staff misread some of the sales literature and thought that it was okay to promise that they, yeah, yeah, we can bring back this old feature. He called his engineers and his programmers to evaluate, could, can we do this? And they discovered that, one, this was years ago, and they built the whole app on a whole new infrastructure, and it was going to cost them hundreds of thousands of dollars to restore this one feature. So. Second thing, what did he do? I heard a few say, listen. It's a trick question. Actually, he didn't. He called them because the CEO didn't know there was a problem. But he did the second thing that's really important, and that is own your part of the problem. Now, Bruce was, um, so he had to call the CEO and notify him of this problem and tell him, I cannot deliver you this functionality, which could have been a deal breaker. Um, he did acknowledge the, what they had done. He said one of our staff misread something and promised something that she's newer and didn't realize that, uh, that we couldn't do. So I want to work, work it out with you. So he, um, he, he, he owned it as a company. They made a mistake, but they really wanted to work with them. They felt like all the other functionality of the app would really help them. And, and, and he, then he sat back and he listened. He asked him the question, what does this feature do for you that was so important that you wanted it this badly? And he was able to you know, get his team together and think through some ways that they might be able to accommodate some of this functionality. And again, we'll get, back, we'll get to the resolution later. This is the one where you withdraw the negative reviews. Okay? So a, customer's given, a bunch of customers had given negative reviews on his company's website. They offered half the people um, an apology. 
and then asked them if they would consider withdrawing the complaint. The other half, they offered money, and they asked them if they would withdraw the complaint. 45% withdrew the complaint after an apology. But only 23% withdrew the complaint after being offered money. A sincere apology goes twice as far as giving people their money back, for most things. I suppose there are some things that, that wouldn't be the case. But there is a great power in an apology. Um, so this is the link. Uh, you can read this report. But um, so apologies are really critical. So uh, Bruce made this apology. And like I said, we'll, we'll, we'll get back to this in just a little bit. My fourth story, IT Angels. Small, new company providing computer services to individuals up to corporations. Uh, they, they needed a, an app built in uh, a mobile app. They came to us. We, were, we started building them a, a mobile app to manage their field staff, which was growing. They only had a few when they started. So we went along. It, we already were really busy. We had a lot of projects. We had one in particular for a large regional utility uh, that was de very demanding. And then, to make things worse, my lead developer quit. There was just two of us, Tim here in the orange, and uh, this person. He worked out a notice, but that just put me severely under capacity to carry this forward. So um, the first thing I did, act quickly. I called Max, the owner of IT Angels, and I explained the problem, and I told him that we were just going to have to figure, would he be willing to work with us, but we were going to have to extend, you know, push the milestones farther out to give me the ability to, uh, to, to try to build this app. Um, I listened to him to find out what it was. Uh, I apologized. You know, I, I couldn't help this, but I was already kind of n almost at capacity anyway, and I probably should have known that if the least little thing happened, it probably would put me in a difficult situation. And then with uh, our senior developer leaving, uh, it really put me in a difficult place. And um, so I apologized, and then he, I started asking him questions about how we could meet his need, still meet his need. So, the, but the fourth step that you want to take, and this is actually one that I'm, I'm really committed to because uh, my wife and I, another thing I, I forgot to mention at the beginning is my wife and I for years have done um, counseling to young couples preparing for marriage and then coaching young couples as they build through the foundational years of their marriage and then help them work through conflicts. We've done this for a long time and we've learned a lot through it and it's really a lot of the same principles. But one of, the, one of the places you have to bring the person, both parties is they're both willing to commit to working through a plan. Most of the resolutions, most of the problems we deal with are not simple solutions. You know, they may require us to cut some fees, to forgive some, you know, to, uh, an invoice or something, to work pro bono for a certain amount of time. It may, there's all kinds of, of things that we have to consider as we work through a plan, but we've got to get their buy-in and willingness to commit to, to a plan to resolve the issue. If you don't have that, like in, for instance, in a, in a marriage counseling situation where you know, people don't like to offend each other, uh, and so somebody says, yeah, 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 I'll work through this, but it's really not in their heart, they're going to bolt at the first problem. They have to really be committed to working through things. And one of the things is to understand, I may misunderstand. I may screw up again. Are you willing to make the choice now to work with me through it? I'm probably going to fail you some, but I believe we can work through to a resolution. You have to bring both parties to the point where they, they have this hope that there can be a resolution. The two companies that I negotiated between, uh, their CEOs had been at odds with each other for a long, long time. There was a long, rancorous history. Uh, but odd thing, and the thing that drove me to this project was I worked a lot with the people on the ground, uh, working on, in hospitals and working in other places. They worked great together. But when it got to anything big enough to involve the CEOs, it just wouldn't happen. And so I had to kind of convince both sides that them uh, collaborating in their space would be a benefit to both of them and to their constituents. So I had to get buy-in from both. Um, one of the things uh, that you need to consider is how far are you willing to take it? You may be in a circumstance where it's just far too costly for you to resolve the issue. Then you have to kind of weigh what does that mean. So you've got to commit to a plan. Now, I said there were going to be two admonitions. 
the first admonition is document, document, document. You've heard it before. You've prob how many of you have been in a company that said, if it ain't documented, it didn't happen? Have any of y'all heard that before? Well, you know, that's true to a point, but if you've made a promise to a customer, they've heard it. It happened. You made that promise. So hopefully you've documented that promise. Documentation is after a meeting. What expectations have you made? Um, I carry, I have just a little app um, that I record after a meeting if I've promised something, and I'll use Siri to say it if I'm on the phone. I don't always capture them. I also use a little uh, moleskin journal to, to kind of keep my days organized. And uh, if I'm with a client and it's not convenient to bring out your phone, you don't want to seem rude, I'll jot it down there. But you've got to find a way to capture promises that you make, and you've got to document. I think some of you, how many of you started off small, kind of a handshake, and then as you grew, though, you realized you needed to codify this relationship in a contract? How many of y'all have been there? It happens pretty quickly, doesn't it? I know we were talking beforehand, and you, you, you realize qu quite quickly that you you really need to have some kind of a documented agreement. So document, document, document. This is especially important if legal matters are, are a potential uh, outcome of your bad experience. Step number five, it's just part of all of them. You've got to execute. Once you have acted quickly, you've listened carefully, you've discerned what the problem is, you've committed to um, working together on an outcome, you have to then come up with a plan and it has to be well documented. You've really got to know what each of you is expecting from this process of, re of, the, of the resolution. Um, you've got to be really honest with yourself. If you have a habit, I do have a habit of being op overly optimistic. It sometimes frustrates people uh, because I tend to be pretty upbeat. But, so I tend to think that we can do things in a shorter amount of time. Any of y'all done that? Any of y'all ever promised to do something in a quicker time than you really had available? Yeah, it's pretty common, I think, among us. Um, so you need to be honest with yourself. I mean, whatever it takes, if it means bouncing it off of a colleague, a family member who knows you and knows your tendency so that you can get a realistic view of, of what it's going to take, but you need to commit to it. You need to set realistic milestones and deadlines. Um, maybe you need to bring in more resources. Maybe you need to reach out for another FileMaker developer to come in and just pay them to help get you back on track if you need more, more bandwidth. Uh, and then communication. You've really got to, through this entire process, communication is important from the very beginning to the very end of a project. But when you're dealing with a resolution, it becomes critical. Follow up. Um, follow up is a way of listening. It's a way of affirming that the person is important and that this process is important. If you don't follow up, even after doing good work, if you don't follow up, your clients will, will kind of think that you don't really care. It's like, oh, they've done the work and they don't really care about me. 70% of customers who've left a company, doing business with a company, do so because they, had a, they felt like the company did not care about them. And that's one of the biggest results of, of, of a lack of follow-up. So follow-up shows that you care. All right, how do these resolve? Service with a smile. Uh, Peggy, the food service company, I had my conversation with her. I listened to her. And she, uh, I heard her that she really felt like we, that the invoice was too much. Um, but I did apologize that she felt like it was too much, but I didn't apologize for the work we had done or the time we took or the amount we'd billed her. I told her that we did really good work here. Yes? Yes, that's a good, a good point. Um, the, the question was, did we give them an estimate? That's actually, in each of these, I'm going to share some of the things that we learned, and that was part of it. So, but what I did is I affirmed to her that we had done good work and that our work was valuable and other people paid us for it, and I believed that the app that we built would give them what they wanted, and it did. We, it had already been proven. So, and so she, at a certain point, she kind of calmed down. She got silent. She said, so I guess I have to pay this invoice. I said, yes, if you would. She said, okay but um, I'm not happy about it, but I will. Well, you know, what ended up happening is this was a success. She became, she's a good client to this day. They're a small client. Every once in a while, we'll do literally 15, 20, 15 to 30 minute little tweaks to their, their, their uh, thing, but she's actually somebody who's well known in the community and her good favor is a good thing to have. So that's a, a part of it. What we learned from this was our estimate. I had just told her that I think this would take eight to 10 hours to do. 
So our bill was like $1,500 or so. Uh, but I learned through talking to her that she doesn't think in time. She didn't, even though she knew our rate and she knew the, the, my estimate, I didn't translate it into a dollar amount. So from now on, whenever she calls, I say, that's going to cost you $45. That's going to cost you $280, you know, something like that, roughly, and I tell her. Because uh, we're on that, her app's little and sim simple, simple, quick things. I also learned, uh, I guess it affirmed to me that if you, if you do stand up for your work, if you do feel like you, 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 you did good work, you should be paid for it. And there's a value there. And so I just kind of talked to her that, and got her to agree that they actually were using the product and it, it was working for them. So that's what we learned. Story number two, membership services. This one was a little more complicated. So I got my meeting with the board, and I'm sitting in the front of the board, and they're telling me about the reason they have to cancel. And sure enough, they affirmed uh, that they did have a finite budget. They only could operate on what they collected. The, the nature of their business did not allow for really grants or fundraising in some way. So um, they saw that this project was going to really exhaust more of their budget than they could afford. I also learned, and this is where the listening came in, that they were, most of the board was not totally supportive of this project from the beginning. They just did it because Frances really wanted it, and she was a very important person in their organization. I didn't know that, but as I thought through it, there probably were some things where, I, where she, was, she had talked about the, the, the constraints of their budget, and I sh probably should have taken that more serious. I should have, so one of the things I learned is make sure that you are talking to the financial people, the ones who have the control over whether you get paid, and find out if they're fully bought into this. Now, I have had experiences where that person wasn't fully bought in, but I was able to talk to them about the value of what they're paying for, and the project has moved forward. Um, sorry. So also, if you, like I said, if you hear talk about budget constraints, take that seriously and, and dig deeper. Listen, explore, find out who you need to talk to to see just how serious this is. You know, a lot of customers will just, they're all a bluster about talk about how much it's costing. Even big, I mean, you know, there's some medical uh, companies I've dealt with that I know have tons of money, and yet they'll nickel and dime uh, for, you know, for a $1,000 bill. Um, we also, just, uh, you know, to remind ourselves that to watch the scope creep. This did get a little bigger than we had anticipated, but we did agree upon these expansions, but it probably did push it be a little past the, uh, the budget, or, or a little, it crept more into the budget than we expected. We didn't understand the influence of this on the budget. So um, this one I would say is a fair resolution. We ended up losing the client, but we lost it, I wouldn't say amicably, but respectfully. Uh, as far as, I actually about a year later called Francis, and I was curious what they were doing now. They actually had found a little cheap piece of software that did some of what they needed. But um, I had even pitched to the board uh, you know, a way of, of help maybe spreading out the payments, maybe doing, narrowing the scope and finishing it the next year. But um, the, there was one really good result, though, of them hearing me, the board hearing me. One of the older members of the board, after hearing me, realized I just wasn't some guy trying to rip them off. And he had just, out of the blue, I didn't ask for this. I didn't even address the outstanding invoice, which I was going to. We had about a $3,000 invoice. And uh, the guy just said, what do we owe him on his last invoice? And Francis told him, and he says, well, I believe he really did good work, and we need to pay him for it. So luckily, we hadn't done much more work since I learned of this problem. But they paid me my check, and then we parted ways fairly amicably. So I would call that a success, but not the result that I wanted. All right, big software. This one was more complicated because it's a big sale. Uh, they met with the CEO. They ended up having to um, offer him some, some things to get him to buy, buy into this. Yeah. So um, what they did is they offered him the next revision of their software for free. Now, this is a multi-tens of thousands of dollar upgrade. But compared to the multi-hundreds of thousands of dollar sale, it was really not that much. They did come in, and they, 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 worked, they committed to working with them to estimate what they could do to deliver some of the functionality this deprecated feature would have given him, but they charged him for it. They did offer a discount for discovery, but they were going to charge him for it. And his explanation is, our programmers do good work, and, they, and they should be paid for it. 
The CEO agreed, they made the sale, and they're a good client to this day. Now, what they did learn, though, is one, they went through a review of their sales literature and made sure it was absolutely clear what they could promise and what they couldn't. They also went through their training procedures and made sure that their sales support staff understood it. And then they put in place a system where no promise could be made without sign off from a systems engineer. So, um, IT Angels. Uh, I called Max. Uh, I wasn't, when, once we made the plan, I wasn't able to deliver it as fast as I, st as I had hoped. Uh, I was really, you know, at capacity. I was working nights and weekends trying to deliver. We, I was. We were delivering uh, the software and updates, but it was still kind of an early stage. And I met with him again, told him that I just wasn't going to meet this plan that we had made. And he was really kind of at ready to pull the plug at that point. But I really believe that we could still work this through. I like this client. The, 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 he and his staff, we just had a lot of common interests. We would get off on wild tangents a lot of times in our meetings and just had a lot of fun. And so I really wanted this client. And also the app that we built was a, a similar app to other things we built. So um, he, I, I, kind of, I just said, all right, they'd only paid us you know, an initial earnest amount uh, of about $1,500 or so. And I hadn't yet billed because of this problem. And I said, look, if you give me one more chance I'll, and it doesn't work, I'll refund your money and we'll cut ties amicably, hopefully. Uh, some have disagreed with me on this. Some of my colleagues have said that I probably shouldn't have done that. But I just felt like I needed to. It's that customer service uh, impulse in me. He, Max reluctantly agreed. We, I worked a long time. It was actually during a DevCon. I literally went to maybe four sessions. I worked during DevCon. <laughs> I worked through the night one night. Uh, while I was here. It was an, the worst DevCon I've ever had, and it was entirely my fault. I delivered uh, on some of the features, and the problem, though, is all the, all the issues. Every time something didn't work, which is normal in, in your testing, they just had no patience anymore. So finally, the guy emails me and says, look, we're just going to pull the plug. I call him up, and he says, we just don't want to even test anymore. So I told him I'd refund the money. I apologized. I owned it said this was entirely my fault. I should have recognized the problem earlier and found a way to resolve it. Honestly, I think I should have reached out to, you know, I've, I've been coming to DevCon for, this is my 14th one, so a lot, I know a lot of you, and I, kn I know a lot of us help each other out at times, and I know that, some, that I could have found somebody to help me with my capacity. And so what we learned, though, was, um, you know, just be really careful about, one, it's this quickness. As soon as I became aware Instead of waiting like several days after our lead developer left, I should have really recognized that was going to make it difficult to deliver, and I should have immediately called him. Um, I, pro I probably didn't communicate as quickly as I should have through the process. I probably should have ramped up the amount of communication with him and his team. And um, patients wearing thin. I guess I should have recognized that and maybe even resolved it at that point rather than promising to refund the money. I think he was willing to just stop it even with the earnest because generally the earnest is not refundable. But I just really wanted to do this project and so I was willing to take that risk. So it was a valuable lesson. It hurt. Um, oh, that's what. Uh, it's, so, you know, I need to be quick. I need to just make sure that I know to, uh, to respond quickly. Um, this one still you know, hangs over my head. I, I, I wish that it weren't so. I, I really like these people. We, we were still on good terms, but I wish that they had confidence in us as a development company. We've done many, many other mobile apps that are doing wonderfully for clients. you know. Uh, but that one bad experience, he'll pro they may never come back to us. Yeah? Hey, there's a, a microphone right here. Do you mind speaking it so we can hear you and get it on the recording? Thank you. You, <clears throat> you said after they pulled the plug, you apologized again. But for what? Because you already <laughs> apologized for that. Yeah, you should have uh, taken maybe less projects or spent your time. But did you promise something like, I will um, we have it ready in a week, and it took three weeks for, it, for you to become ready? Or what was your mistake after? Uh, after it was that they had, they were tired of hearing the apologies. I just wasn't able to deliver, and I didn't recognize that at the time. Honestly, I probably should have referred it to another developer who could have handled them. They probably would have had more respect for me if I had done that. I, might, I would have lost a client, but um, I would have probably earned their respect by being honest. I, I've actually had people come back to me at times when I've done that. 
Um, I, what I apologize for, what I actually did is apologize for the difficulty I put them through. I, I, he had a very aggressive expansion plans. A lot of it was tied to the ability to be communicating on the field, and this app set him back about two months. Uh, so I, you know, I apologize for that, so, you know, because I, I did cause him some harm, and I, I was recognizing that. Does that answer the question? Yes. Good question. Thank you. Any other questions? Yeah. Could, could you do it to the microphone? Do you mind? I was curious if you, uh, was the uh, problem the fact that you didn't have enough people working on the, their project, or was it maybe outside of your skill scope? No. Or was it, was it just um, basically just too much for the people you had working on it? We had a, um, a lot of work going on, our normal support work for existing clients. We had a very large project with a public utility that we really wanted, but they put a lot of demands on us. Right. Um, and it was very difficult to work through some of those. I mean, like one just getting in their payment system, you know, it took us months uh, to get in that. So we, we were just, but we were trying to deliver. We wanted to be in that client. And uh, uh, it was a very complex system, too. But uh, this project was easy. I mean, honestly, if I could have focused on it myself, I could have built it in a few days. I just didn't have that. Mm. So, you know, Tim over here is just trying as hard as he can to, to support and move forward the projects we had. I was looking for another developer and uh, just didn't have the capacity. So, yeah. Okay. It, it's sad. It was an app that I, pro I, I know we've built before. Um, so, Every once in a while, things just, there's a situation that occurs when you just need to fire a client. Now this is, any of y'all been in that situation? Oh wow, okay. Uh, I've, I've only been to it maybe once where I would call it firing a client, but maybe one where, uh, you know, it was just, it was a, a, a apparent that this relationship was not a good one. Um, these are some steps, there was a really good article by Forbes magazine and they, so I'm going to use this as my, as my talk points, but uh, one of them is if your clients are constantly making unreasonable demands on you. You know, they're asking for more than you're willing to do, uh, or more than you can do, or more than was in scope. You know, you, 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 you can't, you all understand, right? Uh, or they want everything for nothing. They nickel and dime your every invoice. They question you about, a new, so, you know, that somebody comes to you and says, well, you know, we'd like it to do this, and you say, okay, well, It'll be about $500 more uh, on, the, on the scope. And they're like, oh, wait, wait, wait. You know, can't you just add that? When I was a newer developer, I probably would have said, yeah, no problem. You know, and that's why projects ballooned. And I ended up doing a ton of work for free. Uh, or they're slow to pay. I was talking to a developer re uh, actually here who told me of, a, of an instance why, why they fired a client, because it was months and months out that they had not even received, they hadn't received an invoice. And uh, they finally just decided to cut it loose because they thought, you know, that shows a tremendous amount of disrespect. Uh, they don't listen to you. You've ever had a, how many of y'all have had a client who hired you for your expertise but kept wanting to second guess you? Any of y'all had that? Yeah. Now, you know, it's, it's even worse than if they've dabbled in FileMaker just enough to be dangerous, right? They think they know everything. I do love working with clients who are familiar with FileMaker because it helps us with the translating what we're doing into their processes. So it's not that problem. It's just... Somebody just always thinks they know better. They know their content, but they don't know FileMaker. And after a while, that just wears on you. They don't respond to you when you try to get back with them. Or they show a basic lack of disrespect. And there's actually a friend of mine who pulled the plug on a, what was otherwise a very lucrative and good customer uh, because there was a key person at that company who kept treating his female staff members with just tremendous disrespect. He'd hit on them every time they went into the company to work. He, he tried to address it with the higher ups, but this guy was entrenched. He was, uh, you know, a, a partner or something. He wasn't going anywhere. They weren't willing to take it seriously. Realistically, my friend could have brought a legal action against him, a harassment uh, thing, but he just didn't want to get into that. He talked to his staff, they and they just all agreed they'd rather not do business with this company. So they approached him. So how do you end the relationship with a, with a, fi a client? Well, first of all, you've got to maintain a professional demeanor. You've got to not get your emotions all in it. And your emotions, like this one where he was offending his staff, that he, he was emotional about that. He's very committed to that. But you've got to maintain a professional demeanor. You've got to talk straight with them and be honest and open. And polite, though. You know, a spoonful of sugar. 
you know, it's easier to attract flies with honey than vinegar, they say. So, but if you can be polite, it diffuses some of the problem and hopefully the anger, but you've got to be direct. Um, document everything. If it's a problem that may have legal ramifications, you've got to document. When I was in iBanking, uh, we, documentation is everything in the medical sphere, you know, because there's, you're at such exposure for a lawsuit. And uh, a lawyer who was, uh, and a medical director for the Georgia iBank, and they, uh, one of their board members who was an attorney, they came together and um, did a mock trial where they put their technical director on trial for omissions on their documentation, and it scared the pants off of all of us. I mean, all of us who were responsible for legal affairs at our iBanks uh, were just, I mean, it, it was a wake-up call how important documentation was. Um, there may be a ch- uh, something where your app is critical to their operation. Perhaps you did it on a work-for-hire, so the app is going to remain there, or you've built it for them and they've got to have it, then, you know, take the high road and work with them on a transition, uh, if you can, you know, work with them on some kind of transition plan. I had a friend who this happened to, and he basically agreed to stick around and support the app until they hired another developer. And, uh, but he required that they pay him up front for it in, in blocks of time. I don't remember what it was. It was like 10 or 20 hours blocks of time. And at the point he got uh, exhausted one, they had to b- purchase another one before he would help them. So he got paid up front. Uh, bill for your time. Y'all's time is, is valuable. You've invested a lot of money to come here, or your companies have invested money. If you have a client that continually like misses meetings, Bill them for that time that it takes to prepare for it, to bring your staff together, to, you know, to be ready for the meeting. Bill for that. It, one, it builds a mindset that your time is valuable. That is really important. Admi- admonition number two, learn from your mistakes. You know, what good is it if you make the mistake but you haven't learned something from it? Johnny Cast, you can build on failure. Use it as a stepping stone. Close the door on the past. Don't try to forget the mistakes, but don't dwell on it. Don't let it have any of your energy or any of your time or any of your space. You know, even that IT angels that I still kind of feel the burden of, I've gone past it. I know that it was, it was my mistake to not recognize the signs, um, and, but I've learned from it. And hopefully I won't make that same mistake again. Any of y'all here are old enough to have watched Captain Kangaroo? <laughs> Do you remember Mr. Green Jeans? He would end every show with, you can please some of the people some of the time, all of the people, um, I'm sorry, you can please some of the people all the time, all the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. There is going to be a time when you just can't please somebody, and you just have to face that reality and being willing to take whatever consequences there are. A um, couple resources will be on the slides. One is this book, uh, A Complaint is a Gift. It's a really good book. Um, Sometimes I think they go too much into an, rather than just telling you, you know, a complaint is a gift. Uh, there's several articles. Oh my gosh, if you Google, when I was first preparing for this, I started Googling articles. Harvard Business Reviews has some great articles. There are links for all of the things I reference in this slide that I'm going to post when I get back home. Um, I, so I will have an update to this. But let me ask you if you have any questions. Uh, about stories I've told, about some of the principles I've said, or to share an experience that you're in and that you wonder if, if there, how you might approach it. If you could step up to the mic, too. What do you do when you deliver what they asked for but not what they wanted? <laughs> wow. So, th- so it was really, was it a failure of discovery? Maybe you didn't listen well enough? Or maybe they didn't know what they wanted. How long did you uh, wait before, from when they contracted with you, you did the discovery, then you built it? Well, it's, it's an in-house project. Uh-huh. So, well, you see, you know, my, it's internal to my company. Hmm. Well, 
Albert Hammer has raised his hand, and I want to have him answer. I think that he has a good answer to this. He and I have talked about this a lot. I used to work for Albert com years ago. Com common issue, right? Um, one of the best things you can do is to have quick rev cycles where you're showing them something within a couple of weeks, which FileMaker is very good at doing. And what we end up saying is as soon as you have uh, a prototype in front of, of someone, there is actually a third entity in the conversation. There's you, your client, and there's the prototype. And things start to become clear in terms of what they asked for and what they really want when they see where you're going with it. Mm. And the idea is to make sure you do those as quickly as possible without worrying about functionality, right? I mean, it, it can be stubbed out. It can be extremely simple. It, they'll, they'll do okay with wireframes at times, but FileMaker is also pretty good at making uh, high-fi, high-fidelity prototypes. And you can go that way and say, when you click here, this is what will happen. It's just a you know, dialogue box. Helps make things clear early, mm. which is, I think, I think whether you're in-house or whether you're out of house, there is this issue of trust. It's a dance at the start. And you want to try and gain their trust early. And I think quick prototypes are a great way to do that. Thank you, Albert. Um, I, I agree entirely with that. If you, FileMaker is so good for rapidly iterating. And the faster you get something working in front of the customer, set the expectation that this is a a, an alpha test. This is a, not everything's going to work. It's feature limited. Be very clear about what this is supposed to do and get them testing. It gets them in it early. And uh, one of the stories I often tell my clients is building software. I used to travel extensively in East Africa. So I've seen mud huts built in every stage. And if, you, if somebody's building a mud hut, they basically stick sticks in the ground. They weave vines or other sticks around it. They, they pile clods of clay into the walls. And then they mud it up. Okay? So if I uh, have a relative come and say, I'm going to live with you, which is a common thing, and I need to expand my house, if I've just got my sticks in the ground, it's real easy for me to pull those up and build another room, right? But if I've mudded this whole thing up and put a thatched roof on it, I'm going to have to destroy stuff in order to accommodate this change. Soft, rapid, rapidly iterated software uh, allows you to adapt to your clients, and it could be your in-house users who are really like your client. Uh, they get to see it in action. They can tell you early on, this is not what I expected. I wanted so-and-so, or the way you've done this. What if we did this? And that feedback is invaluable for building quality software. Uh, there was another question? No, I was going to say, uh, I, I've been doing this for 30 plus years. So you and, should be up here. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I found that my number one job in FileMaker is to set my clients' expectations. Everything mm. else is gravy. I mean, everything. The database is easy once you get the expectations set up. And in conversations with the client, I always say exactly. I'm going to give you exactly what you want, but after I give you exactly what you want, then we have to discover what you need. <laughs> and so it's not in my, it's not in my contract with them, mm. but it's something that I say over and over and over to them. And so you reach a point where I said, okay, well, here's exactly what you asked me for, and it's not working the way we think it is. Maybe we need to tweak it X, Y, and Z way. And I said, see, this is exactly yeah. what I'm talking about. You asked me for one thing, I delivered it, and after we tested it for a while, we realized that there's a, a mistake. And if there's this conversation that goes back and forth with you and the client where they say, oh, yeah, yeah, we, uh, yeah you gave us exactly what we asked right. for, and now here's what we need. So that's, that's good. That's been my approach. Yeah, expectations is huge. I mean, that's kind of implicit in everything I shared. Oh, good, Susan's coming up. I was going to mention you. Susan Fenema is, uh, we used, she does uh, project management coaching, and we've used her. And one of the things that she put in our process is, getting, is demoing to the client and getting their sign off. So you, you, have a, you know that you need to schedule a time to demo it for them, and then you need to get their sign off. And just to put it in your process, written down, so your client, we use Basecamp, Basecamp 2. And so she helped us develop some templates that just, they step you through it. And so you get to that point, and you know, i got to get my client sign off on this feature. So, Susan. My question. She didn't pay me for that plug. Oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you, though. Um, my question is about a client. I've come in at the end 
to help. And I was way too late. Mm. Poorly defined scope. Uh, dead, the deadlines are totally shot. Client says the whole thing doesn't work. You know, it's impossible, it doesn't work. They're out of time, they're out of money. How do you reset that? When you have to have more money to go, you get right. it really like uh, this would bankrupt us if we tried to finish it. Um, but everybody is frustrated. And most of, and the scope is still loose. You're still at the point where you're like, I'm still not even sure what needs to be done. Right. How do you reset that? Well, there's a lot of variation that, assumptions I could make, but um, you know, my, my first thought is, uh, what, is, what is it worth to keep the client? I mean, or what are the ramifications of canceling the project altogether? Are there legal ramifications? Probably. Uh, and, and that's one thing I didn't mention, but uh, there come times when you need to involve a lawyer and you need to ask questions. Um, so I, you, you need to be honest with yourself about what you have to lose here. Um, if it's a client that has, is a high-profile client, the project could potentially get you more business, perhaps you're willing to kind of just do some work to recover it that, that you don't bill for um, because you don't want to lose the reputation or you want the client for the long haul. You're going to have to both, if, if you have to find out whether they're even willing to work with you. And if they are, you've got to have some just really open conversations where you're even allowing yourselves to, to, to get angry in the meeting. I mean, there's a friend of mine who does some counseling, and she's really gifted at hearing people no matter how they approach her. And so you have to have that commitment, hopefully, that even if it gets tense, we're going to work through this. So I would first make sure that I've acknowledged my role in this, uh, possibly informed by my attorneys and reviewing my contracts. The and apology then, thing is huge. I right. just, if anybody is hesitant on that part, owning it and apologizing it for it. With other things, that has calmed the situation down really fast, but it's yeah. not working here. So, but I don't know you. if that answered the question, but that is a difficult <laughs> we, one. We put litigation as an option. <laughs> okay. Five minute rule. Okay, any other questions? Well, thank you all very much. I've enjoyed this. I hope that you've learned a few things from my failures. And uh, if you have any questions, my email is scott at softwarethatfits.com, or you can search Scott Howard Consulting on the web, and um, we'd be glad to, to talk through any of these issues with you. So um, I, I learn best from other people's experiences, uh, and would rather learn from y'all than learn from failing myself. So I'm more than happy to, uh, to talk to you. Thank you.